Well, hello and welcome everyone to another episode of Crisis Conversations live from the Better Life Lab. I'm Bridget Schulte, Director of the Better Life Lab, and I am so excited to be having this very important and very timely discussion today uh, with a great, uh, a, a, a great uh, set of panelists and, and parents here. And the question is really, we in the United States are really outliers when it comes to supporting working families. Uh, we do not have the uh, paid family leave. We don't have help with childcare. It's very much a private responsibility here. That's the way that sort of the, the, the American belief system has, uh, has emerged. And yet COVID has made so clear that this is a real crisis. Uh, uh, parents are struggling. Uh, childcare uh, providers are closing, uh, going out of business. Um, this, is a, this is a huge crisis. And so the question is, you know, one of the questions that, that, uh, that advocates have always said is that, well, you know, maybe we'd get more progress if parents were more involved, if they were more of a force. Uh, but parents are also really busy. Caregivers are really busy and they don't have time to organize. And so the people who would benefit the most from these work family supports are the people who are most stressed and most under, under, the, uh, under pressure and most, uh, most unable to make those kinds of um, you know, uh, political, uh, make that kind of political ask. So the question now is, is, is COVID and this real suffering that so many families are going through, is that changing the equation? So I'm, uh, let me introduce our guests and we will dive right in. And as always, this is live, this is interactive, this is raw and in the moment. <laughs> uh, so we'd like all of you to, uh, people who are participating, please use the chat function uh, to ask a question, to leave a comment. Um, to share a story, uh, we'll, we'll save time toward the end of our conversation to bring you on live or to ask your question. So please feel free to use the, uh, the chat function freely. So joining us today, we've got Alyssa Quartz. She's the Executive Director of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. And she's written a number of uh, really great pieces that we'll be sharing in the chat uh, really looking at the child care crisis, the care crisis. We've got Tamara Mose. She's a sociolo sociology professor at Brooklyn College. She's also the director of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the American Sociological Association. And she's the author of, among other things, Raising Brooklyn Nannies, Child Care, and Caribbean's Creating Community. Uh, we've also got Justin Reed. He's a parent and co-founder of Parents Together, a new uh, a group that's very been, been very active on Facebook in particular. And we've also got Jennifer Beal Saxton. She's the parent and founder and CEO of Tot Squad. Um, we have Deja Reed, who's a parent who's involved with Strolling Thunder, but we might be having um, uh, we might be having some technical difficulties, so hopefully that she she can join us. So, Alyssa, let's start with you. You've been writing a lot about this. Can you, uh, you know, um, uh, tell us about uh, kind of the landscape that you're seeing as you've been reporting about the care crisis? Yeah. So I've been arguing in these pieces I've been writing that we need a parents' revolution, uh, and when I say that, I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, parents are often um, too tired and too uh, stressed, and, and also it's a it's often a, a limited period of someone's life. You know, it's it's not an identity that lasts forever. A parent of a young child, so but all these factors go into them having trouble organizing as a group. But right now, because of the pandemic, because of people's economic problems, medical problems, uh, obviously with remote schooling, this, this has got to happen. This is an opportunity, I think. Uh, some of the things I found when I was reporting these pieces for places like Slate and the Washington Post was that, you know, uh, first of all, infant child care costs an average of 11000 per year. It's more than the price of public colleges in 33 states. And, you know, more in a more local sense, uh, infants are really being squeezed. So you have uh, licensed child care more than three times as scarce for kids age zero to two than those age three to five. And I can get into why that's happening, but it's literally forcing women, I think it was 600,000 uh, last month out of the workforce because they, there's just not even the daycare for them if they were to be able to uh, afford, afford it. So th this is some of the pieces of this puzzle, which I'm, I'm getting into, but I'm so happy to be here, Bridget, and to see Tamara, who's a familiar face from uh, my last book, Squeezed. I, I have her in my, my last book. She's an incredible resource. So oh, thank great. you. 
Well, great. Well, Justin, let's go to you. Um, you know, you're the co-founder of Parents Together. You know, what are what are some of the conversations that you're hearing from parents? Are they, um, you know, is there more of an awakening of, uh, you know, so often parents feel like, or the story is, if you choose to have children, then you better figure out how to do it. Uh, and so that if there's a sense of struggle, there's this sense of personal failure that somehow, uh, you know, that's certainly how I felt as a parent when my kids were young. What's the conversation now that, that you're hearing? What are some of the, the stories that you're hearing from people? And do you think that this, you know, are parents becoming awakened to that maybe there's a different way of doing things and they can be part of that change? Yeah, you know, first of all, uh, super appreciate uh, you putting this together and, and inviting us. And I think, um, I mean, just this is the hardest thing that's happened to families in 80 or 90 years, right? So we have about two and a half million parents that we reach around the country in our kind of membership. And um, more than half of them, I would say, would, would tell us that they're struggling or in crisis. So I think absolutely parents are, um, feel abandoned and desperately in trouble right now. Um, either because in some cases they don't have enough to eat or they can't make rent or they've had to cut back on work or quit work entirely to do childcare or because they're doing remote learning and it's not going well or the kids aren't getting the services they need or they're just doing remote learning and it's going okay but it's still breaking them or they're trying to work at the same time as doing zoom you know so all this incredible squeeze and i think um what but um we did a survey so i, I think that that's the context for what we hear from parents, which is right now in this moment, total desperation and frustration. Um, interestingly enough, we did a survey last week on the election and how parents were engaging around voting. And, and the results I think were really exciting and interesting. So of the parents that we surveyed, 95% um, said they were gonna vote. Um, and 36% of them said that the pandemic and the economic crisis have made them more likely to vote. Um, so even though parents are, literally like voting can be dangerous to your health depending on how you do it. You don't have childcare anymore and you don't wanna bring your kids to the polls. M many parents don't wanna bring their kids to the polls like they did before. Yeah. And um, uh, parents were 20 times more likely to say that the pandemic was making them more likely to vote mm. as opposed to less likely to vote. Wow. So, it, you know, it, I sort of went into this expecting that very well we might see that people were just saying voting is a luxury that I can't afford this year, right? For I follow politics. Most people don't follow politics, right? Most people aren't super political, and you know who who has time for the election? Well, the truth is, parents. The pandemic is actually driving parents to the polls. What we found: hmm. two thirds of them are talking to their kids about the election. Um, Thirty-five or more than half said they were more likely to talk to the kids about this election than any election that's the, 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 in the previously. So. I think there is a huge sense to which parents are, and, and, and another 32% of parents said that the pandemic is affecting who they vote for. And this is in a context in which, you know, pundits have been telling us for months that everybody knows who they're voting for and there's no swing voters and, you know, all mm -hmm. of this is fixed. So I think it's having a huge impact. Um, and the election is one place in which we're starting to see that. And we have parents across the country, we did an event that started last week called Chalk the Vote. And we, you, if you, uh, if you look up the hashtag chalk to vote on Instagram or Facebook, there are kind of beautiful images of parents taking their kids out and chalking voting messages around the country. So, and I know people who have been writing, their kids have been writing hundreds of postcards to voters. So it was really inspiring for us to see the ways in which even though people are so stressed out right now, because government has not been able to deliver the relief that folks desperately need, people are actually looking at the ballot box right now as one way to, to get involved. Yeah. I mean, there's Talk more to say, vote. but that's that's one place that I think it's important for us to start. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Well, I, I, we're going to come back. I want to hear more about Chalk the Vote, uh, but let's go to Jennifer. So Jennifer, t you know, tell us your own story. What what are you struggling with and, and kind of what are you also hearing from your networks and how is this moment perhaps changing things for parents in terms of what to expect or what to demand? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I have a little girl who just turned two and I'm halfway pregnant. I'm like just hit the 20 week mark and expecting another baby in March. A coronial, uh, I think, I think we're saying. <laughs> Thank you. 
so uh, I'm also a tech startup founder. Uh, my company, Top Squad, connects new and expecting parents with services, um, which people are in high need of when their grandparents and extended family can't travel to support them. Things like lactation consultants and sleep consultants and doulas, car seat installers, all done virtually via telehealth. So it's wow. been a crazy time for me during COVID um, as we've pivoted to 100% telehealth offerings. Uh, going through a startup accelerator, just like really, really like lean into your career type of moment for me. Um, and at the same time, my husband is a filmmaker. Uh, I live here in Los Angeles and Hollywood effectively shut down completely um, mm, in yeah. March and has slowly started to reopen a little bit. But um, it's a little scary when you're a startup founder and, and a, a starving artist um, trying to uh, handle childcare. And as a breadwinner for my family, it's a lot of pressure. Um, and what happened to us is my daughter turned 18 months in March and 18 months is like such a hard age because they don't have the attention span for screen time yet. Like they're, they are like extremely mobile, but not yet very communicative. And so we had actually planned to start her in daycare in March. Um, and, uh, as we know, that obviously didn't happen. Our nanny who we had been using prior to that was quarantined because she was over 70. Um, and obviously we did not want to risk her health. Uh, and so the first few months, we were really, really struggling, um, mm. trying to juggle my work schedule and taking conference calls at home with um, a, a really active toddler. Um, and we had kind of a, a participation in a parent need program at the preschool we were hoping to enroll in in the future, which has gone completely uh, virtual. And, and, you know, 18 months old, like I said, no screen time attention. Virtual school does not work for toddlers. Oh, so no. I just really resonate um, with the the uh, crisis that's happening in America that Alyssa was talking about. Um, I've been meeting with congressmen and congresswomen. Yesterday I met with uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass, met with Brad Sherman last week um, about, you know, all of the things that small businesses need in this crisis, but really also emphasizing the need for better paid parental leave, family leave for families that just cannot work while juggling childcare and virtual school and everything else, um, and just more support for working parents. There, are the, the statistics around a million women leaving the workforce last month, I mean, it's just absolutely mind-blogging. It's going to impact our economy for years to come. Yeah, so um, uh, Tamara, let's go to you. So put all of this in context, you know, and, and help us understand how is it that we got to this point where parents don't expect or demand much in, in terms of supportive uh, policies like paid family leave or uh, help with child care or flexible work or schedule control or, or you know, practices in, 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 in workplaces that could make work and care uh, work so much, so much more seamlessly, um, right. you know, kind of help us understand how we got here and how this, how COVID is shifting the, uh, shifting the equation or shifting this moment. Yeah, thank you for having me on this panel. This is uh, all important work that we're talking about here. Um, so for me as a sociologist, I'm always looking at social structures and how the structures are influencing our individual lives or our group lives as communities and so on. So for me, I'm looking at everything structurally and that's how we really got here. So, you know, Jennifer just mentioned not having proper maternity leave um, or even paternity leave for families. Uh, that's all part of the structure that we're talking about. Now, I'm from Canada, so you already know I have a whole different way of looking at all of this. Do mothers need a year off? Yes, we do. Do fathers need a year off? Probably do, yes. Um, there are a lot of things structurally that needed to change prior to the COVID hitting and that can still change if we advocate for it. Things like universal health care. Um, I will hit that one hard. We need universal health care so that people who do get sick during COVID times or any other kind of time can get the help that they need so that they're not suffering for any reason, not being able to go home to their families and so on just because they don't have the resources or just simply dying and leaving mm. their families behind. Universal health care would alleviate a lot of the poverty that we see in this country. Uh, getting people the preventative health care that they need, uh, getting them the tools, the PPEs, the everything that they would need in order to combat such a pandemic, and even just getting the information to people in a, a more widespread way. So universal health care is one issue that we've always been dealing with. Um, 
that has been pegged socialist and has been pegged, you know, communist and everything else. But the reality of it is that America is one of the very few places in the world that still has yet to adopt this universal health care. So that's that's one of the big points that we need to discuss. Also, you know, basic. I, inc- I was sorry, just going to say, like you were talking about, you know, um, you know, this notion of socialism. And, you know, when you look at child care, you know, or in, in the care economy, I was talking to an advocate and they were saying, why is it socialism at four and below and a public good at five and above? You know, so Alyssa, can we go, you know, talk with you a little bit, you know, like kind of what is that about that, that mentality that, you know, that young children, that there really isn't sort of that you know, that, that kind of public good or that kind of that, that sense that this is actually good for families, good for children, good for all of us if we come together and support working families? Well, for me, it's, it's always seemed like a no-brainer. Why does suddenly the public uh, school system and public support of families and children start when kids are five? And obviously, in some places now in, uh, say, New York City, where we have uh, pre-K, 3K sometimes, uh, that that's changed that those that but it never includes infancy and it still in a lot of places it does include three and four year olds and I mean I think part of it is there's something punitive about attitudes towards women's working that have trailed us for our history as a country and whenever it's a, a young child you know there's the sort of hard as it is to imagine there's the dirty secret of the mother working that means that that's why they need to be cared for by others and I feel like that stigma is part of what is driving something that as well as the economic element like that's how it is in America you know our our government is always trying to think of ways to not care for its citizens and not care for its women and its families but I also do think it's there's something punitive about it um which doesn't make any sense, honestly, especially if you are a hardy capitalist. Why wouldn't you want all your uh, citizens able to be working and, and serving their corporate overlords? Um, but instead, but there, but there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of punishment involved in it. So, uh, what, what's interesting too is that but some, if I could just, I, I just, I yeah. do want to just dive in just quickly sure. because this really isn't about socialism versus capitalism because there's a lot of really great, uh, great examples, exactly. very dynamic you know, capitalist societies that do have these kind of collective, uh, this understanding that that supporting families is an investment in the future. So there's sort of like democratic socialism in the Scandinavian countries, just about every other advanced economy every has some advanced. kind of paid, you know, paid family leave, some kind of support for, for childcare. You know, so I just, I did yeah. want to just, I wanted to insert this Pabwood. that we're not talking about like, like right. kind of crazy way lefty kind of ideas. Not at all. We're like Papua New Guinea. I mean, that's like, that is the level of uh, uh, desolation that our families are left with. Uh, you know, if you look at the OECD numbers about investment in childcare and young, and young childhood, we're, we're seriously one of the lowest countries in, in terms of investment and like uh, France and Germany are ahead of us and, you know, any decent democracy is sort of basically ahead of us. So, I mean, w- I think a lot of this ha- has to be a reframe. Um, and indeed, it does. It's not it doesn't have to be socialist. How do we allow women to continue to participate in the economy? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's that's part of the question. And that is going to take an investment in child care. So, Jennifer, you you were just waving your hand. You'd also. Talk yeah. about you know, the, the numbers that came out just last, uh, you know, last month that, you know, more than 800,000 women had dropped out of the workforce. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? It's, it's crazy. Well, what I was going to say is I think that it's not even just about the women leaving the workforce. There's also structural challenges with the motherhood penalty, right? The statistics show that uh, women, career women, working moms, uh, are actually punished at work for being moms and trying to juggle, you know, everything that is involved with being um, the person who often carries the emotional load, the mental load for managing most of the dynamics in the home life as well as their career. Uh, at the same time, men are receiving promotions and pay raises uh, when they become fathers. And so I think it's, it's not just about solving for um, the child care issues where we don't have like the active hourly moment by moment supervision of our children. There is so much of that workload that is falling on women that is impacting our careers in so many other ways. There's really a full ripple effect. Mm-hmm. So Justin, if we could go back to you, like, is that, is that, it sounds like that's a lot of what you're hearing with your community. 
um, you know, and that they seem, sound so much more uh, energized to, to become involved or, you know, uh, either vote or, uh, you know, become in part of a much more engaged, you know, civil society, if you will, you know, is, is, is some of that coming from the pain that Jennifer's talking about? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, you, you framed this panel around kind of this big question about is this movement, you know, finally coming together. Um, and, and I, I feel like at a top level, the answer is there's potential there. And, um, but it's, it's, but it, it's also complicated. Um, mm -hmm. Because, right, it's, I think the, the potential, first of all, there's been incredible organizing that has already been happening by leaders, grassroots leaders in the childcare sector, right? So I, I want to like, I don't want to overlook the amazing work that people are already doing. Groups like no, Moms that's Rising actually a really, really change, good point. You know, yeah. Moms and, Rising, Family Values at Work, you know, zero yeah. to three, there are all sorts. And I think that's important to call out that there's been good work done in this space for a long time. And I think the fact that, uh, you know, the, there's been some momentum and, you know, there are great proposals that have been put out in this, during this pandemic for stabilizing the childcare movement, not enough in the HEROES Act, and then a bunch of work done to try to deal with that. And so in the midst of chaos, lots of really good organizing happening that I think, so realistically, there will likely be more relief at some point, um, God willing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a good chance that support for childcare at, could be part of it at a much different level. And that's because of all the organizing that people are doing right now, um, including providers um, who are, dealing with, you know, here I see it in Brooklyn, there's an amazing dynamic network of providers who, and parents who are organizing together, despite the fact that they're in dealing with such huge challenges, just trying to keep their childcare centers afloat and deal yeah. with the constantly shifting blizzard of, you know, directives and stuff. But I think at the, but the, it's also worth noting that um, for parents right now, people are being pulled in really different directions. So it's yeah. like the moment we're going to see a huge push for support for childcare is not the moment that families, half the families are afraid to send their kids to childcare, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or to school, <laughs> right? That parents are totally split on whether it feels safe right. to have your kid in that setting, partly because of their own families. Especially and... when you're pregnant, you know, right. it's even scarier to send your kids somewhere. It's like, I'm a high risk category now. Right, yeah. right. Totally. And so, and so we hear, yeah, so we just, we, and the things that are at the very top of parents' agenda who we're talking to, it's just financial support. I right. don't have enough money to make it through the next three months. We need direct payments. We need rent relief. Like, right. So yeah, that, that Mara, stuff yeah, yeah. is really galvanizing people in this moment. And it, it's not childcare specific. Because mm -hmm. so many people I feel like I, I childcare, I can't even send kids right now. Yeah, Tamara. Yeah, I saw you nodding, and you yeah, wanted just, to talk about like universal basic income, that sort of direct. Yeah, there's basic income. There's right the universal health care, the universal child care. All of these things work hand in hand with one another to help alleviate the stress that everybody has felt prior to COVID, and is now under the thumb of COVID. So it, you know, to not talk structurally about things is, is just ludicrous to me. So I'm, I'm glad to see that there is some movement in that direction when we talk about potential new administration coming into play. Um, but at the end of the day, we have not seen a big enough movement across the board when it comes to administration and pushing mm -hmm. these things forward, even though we know they've had success, not even in different countries, but even when people pilot study them in cities across the USA, they have great success, especially the basic income endeavor. So I think we really need to push for these structures to change. One thing that hasn't been mentioned, and I want to mention it because I'm an advocate for it, um, is special needs children and how parents are dealing with that. I have a young son who's seven. I have two teenagers, a 16, 15, year old and then the seven-year-old who has down syndrome mm. and just seeing how remote learning changes for him versus wow. my other two children wow. it's such a big leap because yeah. now you have to deal with therapies online now you have to deal with the cognitive association <laughs> with a screen and what does that mean for somebody who has delays and nothing translates the same way. So it's really important for us to consider that constituency as well. And that, that 
additional stress that parents have when dealing with children who have any kind of special needs, especially if yeah. those who have physical needs that aren't yeah. necessarily always met at home, but met outside of the home. Right. So there are all these different ways to think about it. But I think if we look structurally at what's going on, we'd be able to help parents in a significant way if we had those changes structurally. Excellent point. So at this point, it looks like uh, Deja was able to uh, join us. We've had some technical dif difficulties. Uh, Deja, are you there? Can you um, can you share your, uh, can you come on? We'd love to hear. We've been talking about what parents have been struggling with uh, during COVID and whether this could um, inspire them to uh, take more action or become more active and in sort of asking and demanding for change or support. And I know that you are a member of Strolling Thunder. So uh, w w welcome and we'd love to hear your story and, and what what sort of drew you to, to become active in Strolling Thunder. Hi, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great, thank you. Okay, perfect, thank you for having me. Um, and as she was saying, my name is Deja Reed. And um, so, yeah, like the whole thing with me wanting to be a part of Shunda Thole and Died, I, I did experience a lot um, a difficult and challenging time getting childcare when I first had my son um, in 2018. And so it was a difficult time and a challenging time in me as a single mom and not being able to um, go to work and do the things that I need to do to, to provide a life for us and, you know, not having good quality care for my son. And um, as my experience went with COVID, um, it just kind of brought a, a more of a strain and a more difficult situation by my son daycare closing. And um, it closed actually before the time of my job furloughing us and sending us off. It closed like two to three weeks prior to that. So mm -hmm. I had to go through pay and, um, just different things of that nature. And so now it's just it's a, bit of a challenging situation, I want to say. It's very challenging as a single mom to be in a position right now um, to have, you know, to, to face the challenges of not having good quality care. And um, now I'm kind of in a position where I found good quality care after months of, you know, not being able to find it because my son daycare actually ended up closing down permanently. And um, wow. so I finally found some place to go, right? And now, you know, he was there for a few weeks and my job was saying, okay, I can come back in phase three. And they actually just ended up cutting my childcare uh, completely off because of the fact that my last two checks, I haven't had any checks to prove my payment, but it's like, I can't start working unless I have the childcare, right? So now I'm even in a more difficult, you know, situation because so I can't, you know, so they Go didn't ahead. make any they didn't make any kind of uh, accommodation or uh, kind of uh, like recognize that we're in the middle of a pandemic and that you know they, they weren't willing to work with you or be flexible in, not, in terms of not at all not at all I've called and I was and they cut it off before you know I even knew about it like after I had sent them a pay stub because of course my pay stubs are at zero zero I'm still employed with my company. Because you're, um, you're technically on furlough, right? So you're still employed, even right. though you're not getting a salary. And so, and this is th these are for the the childcare um, subsidies to help uh, to help pay for childcare. Is this this is what you're referring to? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. So, um, yes, so they ended up cutting completely off because of my tech stuff. They were like, okay, well, you're not working. I'm like, well, I'm going back to work. I just have to find care for my son. And I had to, you know, of course, my job had to have me come back and tell me, tell me it was clear for me to come back. So mm -hmm. finally, they cleared me to come back and I can go back to work. And now I don't, I can't even see my son to daycare. And they're like, oh, well, you can just pay, you just have to pay for that money. And once you have a paycheck, right, you know, once you have a paycheck saying that you're working, but I'm like, how can I pay for it if I'm not working? You know, right. like I don't have other bills and other things that I have to take care of, especially as a single mom. So it's a very challenging time right now for me. Um, I don't, and I just found this out actually last week. So, um, you know, I thought I was in a, on a good track because, again, I had found a place for him to go where they were actually accepting kids because there was a lot going on where a lot of daycare is closed. And then, you know, just finding good quality care for your child, right? It's just so hard these days. Right. And now it's even more of a challenge because, you know, everybody they don't know they're not accepting the same amount of numbers that they did have so it was a, right. it was a real challenge for me so um just you know just kind of 
dealing with those things and um you know pressing you know forward and everything but it, it, it is a very challenging time as a parent as a single mom and you know that's in school I am in school I'm working and I'm doing other things to try to get to where I need to be but it's just very challenging doing you know doing that with the stressful of with the stress of not having care for my son in the day right time. so 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 Deja yeah. you're 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 working, you're going to school, you're struggling with childcare. What is it that you would, what is it that you need or would expect, you know, what, as a, as, as a single parent, as any parent here in, in the, in the country, what do you need? What do you want to see change? I would say that, you know, as I would have thought that they would at least been more understanding to our situation, especially with the pandemic going on. Um, I would, you know, I would, I would just hope that they would actually listen to people and their stories and, you know, the time that we're in, everybody's not lazy, right? Like everybody's just not wanting to sit at home and live off the government. Right. You know, I, you know, I'm a, and I've, you know, I've had to do the things at home just to make, you know, make ends meet. Like, you know, everybody's not trying to, you know, just get over, right. You know, it's people out here that's truly wanting to make a better life for their families and, for their children, you know, and, you know, just to have that support, and, okay, just to have that support, you know, I apologize, guys. No, no, you're, you're, you're dealing with exactly what we're talking about, but we're coming down right. on time, so Alyssa, let me go to you for a final, kind of a final thought, and you're on mute. Um, when I'm listening to that, uh, hi, Deja, I, I'm just thinking, um, you know, Biden does have a plan for a tax credit for parents, and I support that. But I, what we really do need is this parental universal basic income that would not have these hoops for people to jump through and waiting for taxation. And I think, I think that that's the sell really for also for UBI. I think for all those, you know, fun nerds out there who are supporting universal basic income, I think the the practical uh, ramifications of having one that's really for parents or, or people taking doing care work uh, of disabled or elderly people in their families like that's a kind of targeted uh, basic income guarantee that I think could really work so to me that it would be part of the solution and part of what this parents revolution that indeed moms rising and all these other groups and hand in hand uh, the some of the domestic work groups have been doing but so this is one of the main things that I think we should be fighting for all right. Well, with that, I want to thank all of the panelists. I'm, you know, uh, we could go on for hours. So I'm sure that this is a conversation that we will continue. I want to thank all of the panelists for, for coming on and sharing their stories and insights and wisdom. I thank all the participants who are listening. I want to thank the New America Events team, the Better Life Lab team, uh, David Shulman, our producer. Uh, and at this point, I, I want to just, uh, we'll be back uh, in another month where we'll, we'll have another crisis conversation as the crisis continues, uh, sadly. And in the meantime, wash your hands, stay safe, wear a mask, and we'll see you in a few weeks.